you know, we probably all see this. We all see people doing the exact same things over and over again. You know, and you know, it, it's kind of a common thing because customers face the same challenges. You know, they're using the same you know types of you know uh, applications or using the same you know database that everyone else is doing. So they kind of fall into the same you know pitfalls. And so, you know, a lot of companies though, and uh, originally this was. I was going to compare clients to force comp, but the marketing people said that wouldn't be very good. Um, so I had to change this slightly. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of companies, they start off small. And so, you know, it's one guy in a, you know, garage and he starts hacking away at some PHP code. And then all of a sudden overnight, you know, the company becomes really, really successful. And, you know, now they're a multi-million dollar uh, company and they never go back and fix some of those, you know, core initial things that, you know, they hacked in there originally. So. These are kind of the 10 things that I see the most. Um, and as we go through these, there's actually going to be more. Um, and, and you'll see more as we, we walk through these. But um, these are kind of the top 10, you know, top uh, you know, high level list here. You got it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, so the first one is, you know, people always assume that more is better. Okay. You know, I want faster CPUs, I want more memory, I want more of this, more of that. And you know, in, in a lot of cases, more is better, but in the case of MySQL, sometimes there's certain things that more is worse. Um, and some of those things are like the per thread buffers. Uh, on the per th thread buffers, these are allocated per connection or per thread. And I've seen people set these to some giant, giant number. And uh, that can actually cause all kinds of weirdness to happen, not only swapping, but um, it can also cause changes in how memory is allocated internally in MySQL. Um, I've also seen people who don't reserve enough memory for the OS. And in those cases, um, you know, you're going to have swapping, you're going to see all kinds of, you know, weird things. But I always recommend a minimum of, you know, four gigs. Um, typically, and I'm talking like a 32 gig, 16 gig system. Obviously, if you have a four gig system, you can't allocate four gigs. Uh, but, you know, I, 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 as you get more threads, I would up that a little bit more. Um, so setting these you know, really high can cause bad things. So. All right, and this gets back to the per thread buffers. Back in 2007, I was working with another consultant, uh, Monty Taylor, actually, you might see his name mentioned here. Um, and we ran into this problem with the per thread buffers where we had a client who was actually over allocating those per thread buffers. And it actually internally changes from allocating memory using uh, malloc to using mmap, which changes the performance characteristics of MySQL. So you see here, um, with a 5 meg read buffer, which is one of the per thread buffers, uh, CPU utilization uh, to do the mem set actually took 25%, whereas when we dropped that down to 128K, we saw a 10% reduction in CPU utilization. So um, drastic reduction. I mean, 10% is actually pretty decent reduction just by changing that memory thread that shouldn't affect CPU performance. Um, the other thing on the opposite side of over allocation is a lot of people tend to leave the configuration as defaults. Um, and that's all, often a bad thing. So hopefully nobody here is going to do that. If you're at the conference and you have your database stuff set as default, I don't know if I can help you. I mean, you know, maybe, you know, uh, you, know you can. Call me and I'll pay me a lot of money to fix these, but you know, okay. I mean, but big ones: InnoDB buffer, uh, pool key buffer, query cache, uh, TRX commit. So, if you want examples of uh, good MyCNF files, uh, bigdbahead.com. I posted a five-minute DBA blog post on these, so you can get download sample configuration files for you know eight gig, thirty-two gig systems. Um, it depends. Um, so, like, if you're talking key buffer, key buffer, you can only go four gigs by default. Well, it's mostly in ODB. I don't really need. Key oh, oh. So you're saying if you're mostly in ODB, yeah. generally I leave it at 32 to 64. Um, but typically, I don't even know if you would need that much. I haven't done any tests with that. I just tend to just leave it. Not really. I mean, and if you're worried about the extra 32 gigs of memory or 32 megs of memory, I mean, that's really not all that much. Since it's only allocated when it's needed once, I don't think that's an issue. 
All right, uh, swap. Um, and this gets back to not leaving enough memory for the OS. A lot of people have, you know, really smart people have said, turn swap off. Okay. I tend to disagree with that completely. And the reason for that is if you turn swap off, MySQL, if it needs uh, memory, uh, or the system needs memory, could kill MySQL, um, which is a really bad thing to have happen. So if you swap on, you might get really slow, but would you prefer to be slow or dead? I mean, it's kind of a, you know, take your, you know, pick your poison. You know, I prefer to be slow rather than dead. Um, the other thing you might want to adjust is your uh, swappiness. Uh, anybody know what swappiness is? Who a couple people do? Yeah. All right, great. Uh, swappiness is set, a setting that's used for your file system cache, so how much the kernel is going to try and preserve memory for file system. Yeah, actually, a colleague of us uh, wrote a blog post on swappiness, and it is de defined as a comment in the code as the likeliness of the kernel to swap out memory, even if it doesn't have to. Yes. Yeah, exactly. yep. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So you, you'll actually see on systems when you start running, and you know, with it's like 60. 60. 60. Yeah. And yeah. the meaning of the 60 is a bit weird. It's not here. But the point is that if kernel already started swapping, even if you change that, it doesn't change the behavior. It's a, it's a bit weird, but if you change it beforehand, oh. that's not too bad. It will oh, have to swap it out. But if it yeah. already started, I noticed that it's you. Yeah, I, I think it picks it up as, as the uh, things spawn off. So, yeah, it's it's something that, you know, you can have swappiness uh, turn to 60, and you can see that you have two gigs of memory free, and all of a sudden you'll just see swapping for apparently no reason. You're like, wait a minute, I've got two gigs free. Why am I starting to swap now? Well, that seems kind of odd. So um, I just added the link to the um, to the, uh, the MySQL conference notes on the wiki page. If you guys know that, I just added the link to the um, to the uh, post that Augusto was talking about. And I will say that it's not just a current um, Indian employee; it's actually a former MySQL employee. So oh, that's true. Yeah, it, and and this is something that we see a lot. You know, it's just the best practice. Um, in I don't want to say this is this itself is an issue. Um, you know, it's not like you know, everybody misses this, but it's not something that's going to kill you if you still have it set to 60. Um, it's just uh, kind of a best practice. All right. How many people use text fields? One forced to. Okay. One forced to. See, that's good. How many people use them and don't know why you use them? <laughs> people who do that. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, a, a lot of people don't realize that there is no longer the uh, limit in the size of text fields that you can actually go up to 64k in a text field theoretically uh, because each column while theoretically you can go to 64k um, the row size can only be a maximum of 64k so um, you could have one field or one column that's 64k or you could have two columns that are 32k but you can't have multiple 64k columns in a, a bar chart so uh, so from the text fields uh, side uh, a lot of people just don't need that. And the reason why we tend to avoid text fields is everything that you have to do, uh, like aggregates, order by, you know, group buys, uh, sort buys, um, actually has to do temporary tables built on disk or file sorts. Everything has to happen on the disk level instead of in memory. So it's incredibly inefficient. So by avoiding text fields, you can see an incredible boost in performance. On the opposite side, the flip side, with the client who did everything wrong, uh, names will not be forthcoming, they actually made this change, but they did it without testing. And so, uh, think about this: if you're completely disk bound, okay, and uh, you know everything's you know running okay, it's a little slow, and you switch everything over to use var chars. Now, instead of using the disk, it's going to start using the memory. And so now it's starting to evict everything else that they were, you know, uh, hoping was in the InnoDB buffer pool, and it caused this giant weird cascading thing that uh, they had to back this change out. So test this. Don't just implement it, but uh, you can get a huge boost in performance by um, you know, uh, changing your text fields to var chars in some cases. Oh, yeah. And Ruby does a select star so uh, on a lot of things when you do Rails apps. So even if you don't want the text field in there, sometimes you'll get it, and then it will do the temporary table builds. So just something to watch out for if you're doing a Rails app. So if you ever wanted to know why Twitter is down so much? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, and, and a lot of times, you know, uh, Rails will do like select distinct star, you know, and just some nasty stuff like that. So, uh, so anyways, okay. So kind of you know going away from that as well is data size. Um, you know, this is this is actually a bigger issue than most people think, and it's and it's almost like an archaic thing. If you think about it, way back and probably before most people were born, people kept on. You know, it was trying to bite pack. You know, like how do we fit everything into 16K of memory on machines? So, you know, now everybody's kind of, ah, we're lazy. We're just going to make it, you know, as big as we want it. But really, this can provide a huge savings, not only in disk space, but also in memory utilization. So, um, you know, when you have a bloated data type, let's say you over allocate, you know, a char 100 when you only need a char 20, um, that's actually not only disk space, but it's also going to be read from disk, and it's also going to be stored in memory, so that means you're going to have less things in your buffer pool than you actually need. Um, and another big one here is uh, InnoDB primary key stuff. Can you define custom data types in C? No. No, not in my scope. Does anybody know? I'm pretty sure you can't. You, you cannot. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of tons of different types of, of data types, but yeah, there's no way yeah. to most most data types are represented, but you can't really say, oh, this is a number, but you can't add it, you can only multiply, things like that. You can't really At some point, you could use bi a binary, you could use a most and it's yeah. not easy to work with it. Yeah, you could do like, yeah, user defined functions in C, but not data types. Yeah, like user defined functions, not the kind of binary. Yeah. Uh, the other big place um, with, with data types. So the other uh, huge thing with uh, data type sizes is with primary keys. On the primary key side of things, uh, in InnoDB especially, primary keys are clustered indexes. And what that means is every subsequent index is going to contain the primary key as a lookup back to the original value. So I've actually had, and I don't think that I have a slide on this. No. Okay. Um, and I actually posted a blog post on this because I ran into a client who did this uh, specific thing to the extreme. And they had, uh, I think it was a 64K uh, InnoDB primary key, uh, which is just massive. And um, it, it was a uh, hexadecimal GUI ID that was generated by uh, Hibernate, which is you know just awesome in and of itself. And uh, what we had to do for them is we actually yeah, 64, yeah, K. Byte. Yeah. K? No, 64 byte. No? 64 byte. 64 byte, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Is it bit byte or okay. K? Yeah, sorry. Just, just, just open and yeah. queue. Varchar 64. There, okay. Yeah. Um, so they actually had this uh, 64 uh, byte field, and by converting that to an auto increment ID, um, we were actually able to reduce the size of their tables and their indexes by over 60%, and we were able to see a performance improvement of like 20x. You know, and it was like it was it was insanely you know like just convert the value and everything just drops down. You know, and you know like they they got better utilization out of their memory, less disk I/O. I mean, it just you know it, the the whole system just improved by leaps and bounds. All right, so. Um, some of the data types that you want to avoid, or you want to think about alternatives to, um, you know, we, we, we have you know date time, and everybody loves to use date time for some reason. A lot of um, different applications default to setting up date time, but um, it's an eight byte field, um, and so using a timestamp can save four bytes, which doesn't seem like a whole bunch, but when you have millions and millions of rows, it can really add up. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is if you can't use a timestamp because it is seconds since epoch. Uh, you can use a date field and a time field separately, which for some reason the separate ones are three bytes each. So the combined is is eight, <coughs> but the separate ones are three bytes. And that also helps if you're doing stuff like show me stuff between this date and that date, which a lot of people end up doing. Um, but when you yeah. compare a date to a date time, then it will just say, oh, well, let me convert the date to a date time, and the date time is at midnight. 
So if you say, I want everything between yesterday and today, it's going to give you everything between yesterday midnight and today midnight, which is what you really want is yesterday midnight and kind of tomorrow midnight. Yeah. So you have to be careful about that. And so using a date and time separately is actually better anyway for those kinds of searches. The next one is uh, big ints. And th this one actually is starting to sink in. And I've seen Ronald talk about this in his presentations. And I've seen other people talk about this in their, their presentations. Very few people need to use a big int. Uh, big int goes up to, you know, geez, uh, what is that, 18 trillion something? Yeah, you know, for Woo! things like user ID. I've only been one place that actually requires that, and that's NASA. Um, <laughs> so, and what do they require it for? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like uh, uh, telestial, you know, like, you know, some coordinate thing. You know, it's okay. like something ginormous. That's um, a good point about user ID. Like, do you really think you're going to get more than. Yeah, you think you'll get one billion users or something? Like, yeah. you really think one sixth of the population? I mean, maybe Facebook, which you does in fact use big in for its user IDs and for a lot of other things too, because they have other objects are like the same, use the same kind of other information. I've seen it only a few times where it wasn't either. Yeah, so, so you know. So it relates back to the ego thing you were talking about. So when you're working with some of these people, they're like, of course I'm going to use that one. Yeah, well, I mean. And, and then you just go, well, oh. Well, and that, that's exactly right, you know, and, you know, if you're going to go over 4.2 billion, then, you know, you've got a really successful business model, so, you yeah. know, just keep it better. Yeah. Um, we talked a little bit about text fields, um, uh, floats and, and doubles, you know, uh, not only are they better to do as decimals, but uh, they're also safer depending on what sort of operations you do, because floats and decimals, you might get different results and you won't be able to compare them, um, so I don't know if anybody has experienced that. Uh, oh, uh, don't know if you realize, but you can actually um, do partial indexes. Um, and that's just a quick note at the bottom. Uh, you know, so if you have a uh, variable length, you know, like a varchar, let's say 100 with your last name, you can say index only the first 10 characters of it. So uh, that actually can save. Also, the uh, yes. Uh, I don't think I do. <laughs> just get the view on it. All right. <laughs> um, so, you know, just kind of a summary, uh, you know, some other data type things that are probably good, you know, practices. Like I said, avoid the floats. Um, unsigned variables. If you don't need negative numbers, don't use negative numbers. Oh, I once knew a developer that used a special value minus one. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the only problem with that is that Save Java doesn't know, play well with unsigned. Right, right. You know, and then you can only go up to two point whatever billion. Exactly. <laughs> so my God. I mean. And then what about people don't talk about? I've looked at places where they the parent table is unsigned, but the child table they forget to put unsigned. So then what happens? Well, I mean, it, then it depends on like you know. And it's not foreign key. Well, if there's no foreign key, then it's that's that it's. It truly really is a foreign. Well, right. I mean, it's it's, it's not a. Foreign key. Yeah. It means that if they ever do get to that point, which they probably won't anyway, to two billion, right? Well, this is they were using the right. but they were using. Oh, okay. If they do get to that point, then they'll have a problem because yeah. they'll, they'll they'll try to insert and it will say I can't too big, it or it will give you a warning depending on your SQL. Value. Value. Right. Yeah. Or it'll just give you a warning and. We'll just and put it as the, the last value. The last value. Two to the eight minus one. Seal. Two point one million. A billion. So does the seal? Do you have a lot of? Well, if it's a tiny int and it's two fifty six or one forty seven, it'll just default to one twenty seven, one twenty seven, one twenty seven. Just one twenty seven. I've just seen. Yeah. 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 Y
So don't forget about enums. Enums can actually be very, very, very beneficial, um, especially if you have like you know type lists or things. Everybody know what an enum is? Yes. Um, this is my favorite. This was a guy from MIT. Okay, he decided that he was going to be smarter than everybody else, okay? and uh, decided to use uh, big int as a bit mask. So every position in the 64-bit field was actually meant something like. You know, if you go to position five, it's male, female. If you go to position seven, it's, you know, that they're active, inactive. And he actually was trying to search on this. So all of it, you know, he had to go extract, you know, what the position is. And he couldn't understand why it was slow. So, you know. Or an modulus operation that the Y would be slow. I have an index. Well, that, you know, so, um, don't ask me why, but the, he was a guy from MIT, he had a PhD, you know. And you didn't know about the bit mass field, the bit field, that he could just do that. Yeah. Well, but I mean, he wanted it all in one field, one one column. Yeah. Yeah. Text file. <laughs> 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 well, and actually, you know, that we've done that with a couple clients with, with, with text fields in my ISAM with the full text, is if you have certain things like, uh, uh, I think the, the example that we've, uh, like, like cars, you know, like you're searching for like several different values, you know, like, oh, I want something that's red and that's a sports car and this. Um, if you have those values or the names or the words just in a text field and you use the full text, then you can do a uh, uh, search on it, like a full text search for, hey, I'm looking for a red car, two door, uh, with, you know, the 97 model or whatever. And, you know, it's actually fairly efficient way to search, but side point. Um, so we talked about that. Oh, IP addresses. Hey, how many people store IP addresses in their databases? How many stories are Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, you can use the init Anton function. Um, so that, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, hash values. Sometimes hash values are better for indexes than actual uh, bar charts so, or character fields. So what we've seen in some cases and some really big web clients is, you know, they'll have, let's say, an email address. Instead of storing the email address as the email address, We'll create another field that's a CRC32 uh, value, which is just a, a, you know, a hash of that. And so we can store it as an integer. And then we can search on the integer versus the character. And uh, then use the. What about the lesions? Then we, then we add the email address as an AND. So it's first the hash, then the email address. And sometimes we won't even index the email address because the collision should be small enough where your results that coming back might be, let's say, five records, and you just need to find one out of the five, which means that the index, I mean, it'll help, but it's not going to help that much. Um, and we don't have much time, so I'm going to blow through these real quick. Um, avoid needless data type conversions. Um, everybody loves the single quotes around integers, um, but, uh, you know, you also have things where, you know, you use functions uh, like lower name, okay? Lower name uh, negates the use of the index, so that's bad. Uh, Consider inserting, you know, with with lower. Uh, here's another interesting one. Um, so, so here, here you've got the index or the. Yeah, yeah. There's no function-based index. Yeah. Really. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think we just hurt somebody's feelings there. Well, yeah, and I mean, oh, there, yeah. Are some there are some. There are some. There are some. That's the thing you got to explain. Um, all right, so with, with here, you're, you've got you know the, the single quotes around the integer, um, and this actually does uh, you know like take some initiative to actually convert. It's very small, very tiny, a very tiny amount of overhead to actually convert from integer to, uh, from the character to the integer, but it does still take some. So, you know, you see here, you know, like, this is an ungodly low number, right? Uh, milliseconds here, almost microseconds. But when you look at, <laughs> when you look at millions of these queries, they can really add up. So, uh, for instance, this one, uh, if I did this query 100,000 selects per minute, um, which is a lot, uh, you would actually save four and a half hours of CPU time each day. So, you know, keep in mind that that does cause an issue, but most applications put single quotes around integers just because they're lazy or they just want to know, you know, like make sure that something is 
is valid there. Uh, here's another interesting one, and I've seen this several times as well, where you've got an integer um, field, which let's say uh, name is an integer, and you pass it uh, mat without the single quotes, and it will fail. Um, and let's see, is this right, or I got that the reverse way. No, I got, I got that right. And so, no, no, I got that reversed. Ah, okay, yeah, name, name is a bar chart. So uh, bar chart equals mat will fail because it's not quoted. However, when you do name equals one, two, three, four, that'll actually work, okay? But if name is um, actually uh, in uh, a var chart that has an index on it, it will not use an index because of the conversion. So you'll see it actually does a full table scan, which even though it can't use an index. And that's something that, you know, you see occasionally and it's, you know, really quite bad. Uh, I hate left outer joins when people do them just because they, they want to do them for no reason, you know, they're like, hey, we might miss some data. Um, but uh, one of the things that I've seen a lot of, especially in Hibernate, Hibernate loves to do this, is they'll do left outer joins um, and then they'll negate the use of the left outer join. So if you see here, um, you know, you're doing left outer join, so your BID, your BVAR are both null, okay? And here you're passing in, uh, you know, left outer join, uh, BVAR equals something. Well, that's going to negate the use of these two null values. So you've just done a left outer join for absolutely no reason. So um, absolutely hate that. Let's skip that one. Um, mixing storage engines. Um, I tend to frown on it um, for various reasons. You get the worst of both of the worlds when you mix storage engines. So you know if you have transactional NODB and then you have my ISAM that isn't transactional, NODB is not transactional when you join the tables. So. Um, something to keep in mind. And also you have to split the memory. They can't use the same buffers, you know, like NODB buffer pool versus key buffer pool. Uh, I'd rather have them all allocated to one or the other. But a lot of small places only have one server they can hold. So I recommend splitting the tables in separate databases so that when they before and when they're server, they can migrate the other to another yeah, server. That's, that's a good practice. But when you start, Well, or you just use them all in ODB, right? So, it, you know, I'm saying from a storage perspective, if you're going to be all in ODB, unless you have a real reason to do my ISAM, choose one or the other, um, and then, you know, kind of go from there. Now, it doesn't work with everything. It's just, you know, kind of a, you know, hey, this is what I would recommend. You know, obviously full text indexes. If you're going to do full text, you need a my ISAM table, so you're kind of out of luck. Um, if you're doing logging, I would recommend like the archive or take a look at the archive storage unit. Um, but you know, in, in those cases, um, you, you know, then it's kind of a make your call. You know, what, how you how much you want to allocate things. Um, you can also, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, the separate database is definitely a good way to go. It's just because then you're gonna bump it off once you get money. Right. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so you want to be able to make it easy because otherwise. Yeah. You I mean, you, and you could do other things too. You could start up multiple instances of my. I mean, you know, there's there's a ton of different things. Um, okay. Uh, solo indexes. I've seen clients do this. You know, they'll just add one index on every column, or you know, they don't know that you can have two columns in an index or multiple columns in an index. Not sure why, um, but you know, it's kind of like misconception, bad database knowledge. Uh, but uh, you know, avoid them. Uh, Index merges can happen, and I think that, you know, so for some people they read that, hey, there's this index merge thing, so I can put two indexes together. But it doesn't happen in all the cases. Um, and uh, so don't rely on that. And they're not as fast as uh, generally. So I uh, talked about the primary keys in NODB and the disk. Uh, so, you know, we can see huge performance improvements. Um, so, okay, big one here. This is actually my big you know, problem with most clients is um, I.O., okay? Um, it, it is <laughs> always an I.O. issue. Um, you know, you might have heard this before, or you might have read something, or you might, might have strong feelings a uh, different way, but no matter what you think, you know, I.O. is the slowest part of the database and the slowest part of the server. So in the end, uh, it generally boils down to some sort of I.O. operation. Um, and, you know, Wiki's always 100% accurate, so I just quote it on what I.O. is, you can read it on your PDF if you want. So we need to make I.O. faster in order to make the database faster. So I.O. is not just disk. 
Look, it's also the digestive system. Yeah. It comes in, goes out. That's all I'm saying. Okay, um, but no, uh, I/O is transferring data around various you know parts of the computer. So it's also you know an I/O operation. You can think of it as going from the network to another server to you know get your memcache data, or it could be you know transferring data into the CPU from memory. All those are I/O operations. Um, so yeah, that's all right. So I/O really requires you to go on a killer diet in most systems. So uh, you want to reduce data sizes, which we talked about. Um, you want to reduce what you're asking for. Okay, and this is a huge problem in a lot of client sites. Okay, when people will come and they'll ask for, hey, let me get 50,000 rows and then use only 10 of them. Well, why did you return 50,000 rows? Uh, return the 10 that you need. You know, but people, you know, they they oversend things back, especially on like columns. You know, they might they might do a select star, or they might select you know every column or partial columns, and then they throw those columns away after they've retrieved the data. So you can get huge performance improvements by reducing that. Store procedures can also help, um, so you don't have to transfer data across the network. Um, so that can end up being you know a, a pretty big savings. Uh, Pre-summarizing data, okay, um, that that can also help, um, and obviously buying faster equipment. You know, the, when you can afford it. But generally it's a combination. You know, eventually adding more CPUs, memory, and disk is not going to overcome all of the problems that you have if you haven't reduced your size. Okay. Um, so getting back to a little bit about spindles, uh, not you know, disk I.O. Um, typically when people go and they size new hardware, they look at how much disk space do I need? I need 300 gigs. But you really need to look at your I/O capacity. How many IOPS per second do you need? Okay, and um, you know the, the reason that you need to scale for that is the you know uh, um, the reason that you need to have more uh, I/O capacity is that's what's actually going to slow down your database. So it's all about uh, concurrency as well. Um, so on the the IOPS side. Um, you know, you, you might see some benchmarks and things where people do one thread and they go, oh, we've got this great number of IO operations through this one thread. But really, you have to look at high concurrency and, you know, faster disk is, you know, really the key for that or solid state or having everything in memory. Okay? Um, and it's really disk, I, uh, disk arm movements that end up really killing performance. So you can see here, um, as the number of threads increases, the actual latency of the disk increases. So, you know, this is something that you really have to plan for. Okay. Uh, another kind of pet peeve that really doesn't affect performance per se, more of a pet peeve type thing, um, uh, and sometimes it can affect performance, is laying out the file system in the lungs. Okay. Um, and in this case, uh, you know, Putting swap and MySQL in the same one is typically bad. So we have a lot of clients who will make one file system, dump everything on it, one giant one, you know. And uh, typically, what we end up seeing there is, you know, you have performance issues when you start to start to swap substantial performance issues, and that's where you tend to really lock up and freeze up. And then um, we also see people who fill up things like temp or log space, and all of a sudden MySQL stops working. So. Um, typically, if you can isolate the various pieces of the file system, you're going to be better off. Okay. Uh, a lot of people also think that a SAN is a black box. This is a little bit on the I.O. side again. But um, it's not. You know, like, there really isn't, try not to think of anything in your architecture as a black box. Um, that's just asking for problems. Okay. Um, worked with a lot of different storage vendors. Uh, EMC is a good example of this. Uh, they have a tool that actually moves hot data from one disk to another to try and boost performance. And sometimes it'll move a hot disk to another hot disk, or you'll start moving your bottleneck around. So today, application one is slow, but tomorrow, application two is slow. And the next day, application three is slow, because it's just moved the hot spot to a different location on disk, and that's now affecting something else. Uh, Self-induced fragmentation is an interesting one. 
run into this several times, um, and I think this is more of uh, an old school like file system or Oracle limitation where people will just start having multiple like uh, one or two gig files. Um, you know, and we're not talking file per table. We're talking actual. Hey, let's just start allocating two gigs, two gigs, two gigs, two gigs, and manage it uh, by hand. And um, what you end up doing is you end up fragmenting your system if you have large tables that exceed those sizes. So if you have a 20 gig uh, table and your index or your uh, your uh, data files are two gigs each, it's going to be spread across 10 data files. So if you're doing a scan, it can actually slow down performance. So I put together a quick test. Um, skip through those. And um, this is kind of an outlier, this 50. But uh, you can see, like, for the most part, most of the performance numbers from a single data file were better than 40 individual uh, InnoDB data files. So try and avoid that. Uh, all right. So uh, you can read more. I have this stuff all on BigDBAhead.com. Oh, geez, I ran through it. That's good. Good. <laughs> Questions? Uh, so, so I read, you can read more at BigDBA.com, and obviously here I am at the MySQL camp. Uh, and uh, Solid State Disk and Waffle Grid, we're presenting on that. So you can, you know, if you're going to the conference, stop by and see that. Eves is presenting this afternoon on MDB. Okay. So, uh, any questions, comments? Thank you. Before we